Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before I get to our guests here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Julie Rose on the podcast. She's a bodybuilder coming to us all the way from the UK. But most importantly, she's here to share her journey with us. Julie, thank you so much for being on the show. It's a pleasure. So why don't you give us, first of all, what the weather is like in the UK right now where you're at. So you told us that you're in North Wales right now. So what's the weather like? Um, the weather is absolutely gorgeous, to be honest with you. It's pretty hot. You have to excuse me as well. I'm losing my voice because I've been teaching classes all week and been shouting quite a lot. But the weather's glorious at the moment. Yeah, really, really nice. Let's hope it's like this tomorrow as well. I, I hope so too, because up here, or up here in Minnesota, I mean, we just got done with a rainstorm, so it's a little cloudy here, but I don't want to get everyone all gloomy and down. But believe me, I mean, being in, being in the UK, I bet you guys are used to clouds and, you know, cloudy weather. Yep. That's another big thing that I hear of all the time. But uh, yeah, so why don't you give us a little bit of a backstory on what inspired and what motivated you to get in shape and then how that transitioned into becoming a bodybuilder? Well, basically, I'd always kept fit. I'd always just wanted to be slim and I did loads of cardio stuff, did loads of charity stuff. And then just one day I just thought, I need somewhere to go with this. I'm, I'm keeping fit constantly. I'm doing things constantly. I'm eating little bits here, little bit there, frightened of eating because I just want to stay thin. And I was doing it all wrong and then one day I just woke up and thought, I want to build a bit of muscle, I want to change shape, I want to I want to do something with it. And I had a friend who actually worked for a supplement company and she was always saying to me, why don't you do a bodybuilding show? Why don't you do a bodybuilding show? And I kept saying, no, it's not for me, it's not for me. And then she carried on and carried on. Then one day I just went to her, do you know what? I will do one. And six months later I got on stage, placed, I was tiny. I didn't have loads of muscle mass, but I was 47 years old when I made that decision. And I thought, I've got to, I've got to go for this now. I enjoyed it, only planned on ever doing the one. And that was the end of the season. So it was like November time. Um, loved every minute of it. Had a brilliant coach, just loved everything about it. Um, and then just decided to carry on. I'm 50 years old now and still going and plan to do another few more years. I'm going to take a year out next year. Um, but I've done really, really well this year. And it's been it's been a really good journey. Really good. 50 years old and she doesn't look a day over 25. Again, everyone, if that's if that doesn't make you want to go to the gym and start working out, you know, I don't know what does. I mean, that's just that's just ridiculous. But yeah, I also always love to ask because if you were to walk into a gym with 100 people, I mean, there's 100 different ways as to how those people got into shape, whether it comes down to their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they do, what exercises they do. So many little things add up to the overall package that people end up seeing. Was that a struggle for you when you were getting started? Because I always like to say, you know, if someone were to come up to you and say, you know, like, what did you train for this body part? It looks amazing. What works best for them 99% of the time might not work as good for you. No, exactly. I was just about to say that what works for one person doesn't work for another. I do fasted cardio in the morning um, when I'm when I'm training uh, for a comp and it works for me. It doesn't work for everybody. And people still say to me now, you don't need to do it fasted, you know. Well, I'll stick to doing it fasted because it works for me. And like I say, it doesn't work for everyone. Um, lifting weights and stuff like that, I like to change my, my things around. I like to sometimes I'll work one body part and I'll do that for maybe a full season and then the next season I'll think now nah, I'm going to do a push session a pull session two leg sessions and I change everything around I change the exercises I do different things all the time I, I think change is good I think it's good for anybody and like you say people people have different goals and people have different ways and some people can't stick to the diet but they can exercise some people can do it the other way around, the diet and not exercise. I teach a lot of classes, so I do a lot of cardio. But when I'm competing, I have to hold back an awful lot and talk a lot rather than actually do a lot, which is difficult because then the transition there, I have to change all that around. And sometimes that's pretty tough. I'm definitely one of those people where for me, it's, you know, I can work out like nothing else. But the diet thing is just so hard. But what, what would you say for you is probably the biggest nutritional change that you had to make when you started getting ready for a bodybuilding show? Everything with the diet, everything. I have a really sweet tooth. So for me, I mean, my coach said to me last week, I have to rein you in this off season. I'm going to keep a close eye on you because 
I think last year at off season I actually put two and a half stone on, and I had to get it off and I struggled because um, stayed weight I go down to about eight stone two, eight stone three, um, and you can soon quickly put it back on if you're not careful. I'm trying to stick to an off season plan, but treat myself in between. Like today I've had cake because it's Saturday and it's it's a day off, and I think I've got to give myself that little bit of leeway. I'm doing the um, I do the universe in November, so I know I've only got a few weeks now off, and then I've got to get back on it. Well, yeah, and I, I gotta say, you know, just enjoy that while you can, because believe me, being on that cardio machine, you're gonna you're gonna wish that you had a little bit more cake maybe before in your off season. But I always love to ask this question because everyone's genetics are different. What was one body part when you started training that really, really took off that you don't have to train as much now? And then everyone also always has that one body part that legs behind that they have to train to overdrive. What were those body parts for you when you were getting started? Well, when I first started, I always, I always wanted shoulders, always wanted shoulders. And I used to say to my coach, can I have some shoulders? And she'd <laughs> say, we'll get shoulders, we'll get shoulders. And I must admit, I had a shoulder injury about 18 months ago, maybe a little bit longer. And it put me out for a full season with my shoulders. And I have to lift just light on that now. I kind of semi tore my bicep tendon. So... It, it gave me a lot of pain in my shoulder, even though it wasn't a shoulder injury. It was a bicep tendon. But gave me, I thought it was my rotary cuff at first. So now I'm scared to lift heavy on shoulders, but it hasn't done me any harm. They've grown. I've got good shoulders. My biceps are like men's biceps. Give us, give us a flex. Give us a flex real quick for everyone. Look at that. See, that's insane. That's that's awesome. 50 years old. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's ridiculous. A huge, but I struggle with legs. But I think I struggle with legs because I'm I'm 50. I am on my change as well, which isn't good for us women. Um, and I'm fighting against hormones. So I've had a tough year this year. I've, I've really struggled. Diet has been so low because we've had to take a lot of carbs out. But then obviously taking your carbs out a lot plays with your hormones as well. And puts them hormone levels just, just cocks it all up really. But we got there. We got there in the end. I didn't think I was going to get there. And my coach actually at one point said to me, I think we should call it a day this year. And I said, no, no, I'm not a quitter. I don't quit. Let's keep going. And basically, what you said before about the singing backstage and one thing and another, I, my motto is, it is what it is. And I always say, I am what I am. And when somebody went and got me that brewing handle to do some twists, and I just started singing with it because the pressure backstage sometimes gets a little bit too much. And I just try and make light of everything because I think you should enjoy it. You should grasp it while you can and just do the best that you can. If you don't come away with the first, it doesn't matter. You've taken part, you've done this, you've done that, you've done everything you can possibly do. And everybody who gets on that stage, we're all in the same boat. We've all done our utmost to get there. And everybody has dieted to the hill and put themselves through so much pressure, so much strain. But because we enjoy it, it's what we want to do. So we're all in the same boat. Everybody supports one another. And it's lovely. It is lovely. But sometimes you just get that odd little flicker of people being disappointed. Don't be disappointed. You've done what you can do. There's always next year. Oh, 100%. And I always say it's just so important for the competitors to not base their life based on their placings because, I mean, that's first of all, that's just not a gr great way to go through. But I always say just to be able to get into shape, to go on that stage is an award in and of itself. Just because the general public just doesn't understand that just to be able to get into shape to go on a prep, 95% of the general public does not have the motivation, the driver, the determination to get there. But when you go on a prep, everything is just notched up where, I mean, you got to get all of your workouts in. Your nutrition has to be basically perfect. You have to, I mean, just scientifically, you got to get your meals ready. You got to eat at the right amount of times. What is that like for you when you make that change from, you know, an off season sort of nutrition style to your prep where everything is just so specific? I'm trying to be honest, I'm trying to keep like that off season. I'm struggling at the minute because I've just had my kitchen ripped out and I've no kitchen. But yeah, I'm trying to stick to an off season diet um, and try and, and, and prep my food still in the morning and do it as it is. Um, it's difficult when you first transition over, it's hard to get it in your head, especially if you're working. That's one thing that I mean, I've heard all the time. And yeah, I, I couldn't even imagine what that experience would be like for me. But has there been a specific type of training that you found that has worked best specifically for your body? Um, this year, 
I feel like working two body parts a day has has helped me massively because I feel like I've worked hard. I feel like I've done a push day, a pull day, a leg day, and then started again. And I've been able to get all them body parts done, each of them twice in a week, as opposed to doing shoulders, a back, a chest, and arms, and then legs. And then that's it for your week. I feel like I've worked everything double this time and it, it, it has its work for me it's mixed my training up I don't get bored and I enjoy training when I don't train I hate it I haven't trained there for two days and I am really really like I've got to get up in the morning and go to the gym I've got to I've got to it makes me just feel my head is straight I'm, I'm focused I feel like my day can start do you, do you get what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like you're looking around the house for maybe like a bar to do like pull-ups on or something like that. You're looking for anything to just get any th- type of workout in. I've been that same way where I got to the point where I, uh, you know, I had those times too where I'm just looking around for something to do just because I'm like, I, my body needs something. But then also you got to realize, you know, that you need that rest too. So that's one thing that I really struggled with as well. But probably the biggest surprise that I've gotten from competitors on this show is that for so many of them, posing is the hardest thing for them. It's harder than your nutrition, harder than your, harder than your working out. I always like to compare it now to being a perfect driver where you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a, a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What has your experience with posing been like? Well, it's funny you should say that. My coach is um, a posing instructor as well. She, that's how we met. I went to her for posing and we have ended up best friends um, and we're really, really good friends. We spend most of our time together. We're like sisters now. But she laughs at me because I hate it. She obviously loves it. And because she's my friend, I kind of go a bit, I'll say to her, that's it, I've done now. And she'll say, no, you've you've done when I say we've finished. Like I go for an hour's session and after half an hour I'll say to her, I'm all right now, I'm okay, that's fine. And she'll say, no, we'll do it again. Do we have to? You know, so we do have that conversation. But then when I get out on stage on the day, I love it. I absolutely love it. And I come alive. It's like I hate the practicing of it because I'm, I think I'm frightened in the back of my mind of doing something slightly wrong and changing it and me thinking then, I can't do it like that. That's not what I'm used to. This year, before I went out on stage, I kind of got that mindset back behind stage and thought, right, I'll go out, hold everything up pull my poses, pull them tight, keep it flowy, look feminine, that's the best I can do. And I know this year I actually came off stage thinking I couldn't have done any more than I've done. And it's paid off. It has paid off. I've had a really good year, a really, really good year. And that's and that's so awesome. And I always tell people probably the biggest surprise for me as well is that you could be the most in shape person on the planet. And if you don't know how to pose, good luck even placing because I mean, it's just such a, a huge part of the overall score that they give you. But out of the poses that you do, what is your favorite and what is your least favorite? I like doing um, a double bicep, yep. obviously. I love my biceps. Yep. And this year I've loved doing my back pose because I've worked so hard on my glutes. And then... Um, I always wanted like separate glutes and like striations in my in my glutes and stuff. And I actually got it this year. And it was only when I saw the photographs, I went, look at my glutes. Oh my God, I've got really good glutes. <laughs> I was made up. So yeah, my back pose has been one of my favorites this year because I my back's quite good. My lats are quite good. And I like the detail on everything. And I just enjoyed, to be fair, I've enjoyed everything this year. Everything about it, everything. So you don't have a least favorite pose? Um, what would be my least? Yeah, my abs. Yeah. I kind of, I panic when they say abs and thighs. And I throw myself back too much. I tend to try and squeeze them down too much. And it's been a little bit better this year. I've been a bit more relaxed about it. And some of the comps, they haven't even asked for it this year, which I find a bit bizarre. Because I've moved up into trained figure as well this year, which has been good. So I've moved up a category and still done well. How has the posing changed from the category that you were into the category that you're in now? They were the same poses. I know our our um, competitions are different than yours. You call them like different things. It's like figure and this, that, and the other where, where you are. Yeah, figure, They're bikini, like, and physique. Yeah. Got bikini and toned, athletic, trained, which is what I do, and we're just bringing back in physique, which is more of a female bodybuilding, full blown. So, which is good. 
which is better for me because then the bigger girls get a chance to move because I'm only little as well. Well, because that's one of the complaints that we hear from a lot of the American guests that I have on too is that, you know, there's only three divisions, whereas like in the UK, yeah, you guys have so many more where, I mean, it's a lot more to find your niche. It's a lot easier then. Yeah, definitely. I mean, last I only competed last time two weeks ago um, for the IBFA British and I was able to do the, I mean, I've done like six, seven comps, I don't know how many, in a row. And I've had to go against girls half my age in some of them, you know, which is difficult for me because it puts it puts a mocker on me straight away. I'm thinking, oh, I am I supposed to do this? But I always hold my own. And I know I can do. It's just getting it in my mind that I can go out and think, right, I'm 50, but does it really matter? Hold your head up high and just get on with it. I get this mindset and just do it. But then two weeks ago, I actually went out in the over 50s. So with that, we haven't got, it's not categorized like a figure or bikini or trained or whatever. It is age categorized, which is difficult because then you don't actually know what they're marking it on. And I actually got second in that. And then I did, uh, after that, I did an over 40s trained that was like over 40s but in my category and I came second in that as well so close so close I think you know you're taking that year off you're gonna definitely probably win those then in the next then in the next year so everyone look out for that but I always like to say I'm one of the palest people you'll ever meet in your entire life. Just being, I have, I, I'm a lot Norwegian is my ancestry. So, I mean, I have that skin where I have to have like an SPF of 1 million if I go outside in the sun. So, I mean, I, I've never been tan a day in my life. So I always love to ask the bodybuilders because you guys do get to get tan for your shows. What is that like? Because we hear so many stories about, you know, like you see muscles that you never even knew that you had. Everything really seems to pop out. What is that like for you when you finally get that tan on? It makes such a massive difference. I'm really lucky I've got a tan sponsor and she is really, really good with me. And wherever I've competed this time, if she's not been there, she's sorted out my tan for me with whoever is tanning at the show. I am so lucky with her. Kelly's lovely. And she sponsors me and her tans, just she just looks after everybody from beginning to end. She'll tan you the night before and then you go back, get tanned again the day after. But you're right, when you get... I can feel rubbish a couple of days before I come home up and I'll think, what's going on? I don't look right here. I don't, And we all do it. Everybody does exactly the same. And you realise that this is what we all do. This is how we all feel. We all look. We all think that something's wrong. You're not going to do as well. And it is just, it's just plays games with your head. It really, really does. Because you don't see what the people see. You see the bad and they see the good. But when you get that tan on, you look completely different. You do look completely different. It just brings everything out and emphasizes everything. And it's, again, like the posing, like we said before, it is so, so important that you get that right tan. Because sometimes they're dreadful as well. And you think, oh, that's not a good color. And it doesn't look right under the lights. And if they don't go dark enough, when you get under the lights, the lights just take it all off and you can look white. You know, it has to be black. It really, really does. And it, it's just fabulous. When you get it on, you feel like a different person. Just totally different. Well, and one of the things that I always love to ask too, because it's not really talked about, but especially when it comes to recovery, sleep is so important, especially on a prep. I always love to say my second ever British guest that I ever had on, he was the number one sleep specialist on the planet. He called from Oxford. And first of all, he had the poshest British accent I've ever seen and heard in my entire life. Like I, I felt like I gained like 10 IQ points just from talking to him. Like I, like I was, I honestly told him, I was like, you're going to talk the entire time and I'm just going to listen because yeah. And it was just so awesome hearing him talk about, you know, sleep and the importance of it. When you're in a, on a prep, I mean, it can be so hard to get the proper amount of sleep because when you're all dieted down, I mean, you're going to be hungry and it's going to be hard to fall asleep for that. How do you like to be able to, or what are some tips and tricks that you do in order to be able to get your proper amount of sleep? Because if you don't get a proper amount of sleep, it's going to be very hard as well to work out the next day and still maintain this. I'm not the best person to talk to about sleep because I don't sleep a lot. I, I, I am one of these people, that, I don't really think that I need a lot of sleep. I do for recovery and I do try my best. But I end up taking like, um, you know, like the night soul things to try and sleep and things like that. And I'm a terrible sleeper. I have four or five hours a night, which is nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough. Um, but I always eat before I go to bed anyway. I eat when I, when I go to bed. I take my last meal up with me and I'll have something that will feed my body through the night, something that will release protein slow. 
Like, for example, a lot of the time I'll have either egg whites mixed with protein powder made into a pancake and one full egg, just one yolk in, but then like four whites. I'll blend it and make it into a pancake and I'll eat that before I go to sleep and then it'll feed my body slowly through the night. So I don't really get too hungry, but I wake up with burning hunger pain. It's like, I'm starving. Do you just have, do you just have like a stone's worth of caffeine basically then throughout the day? Cause that's the only way I could really be caff. That's the only way I could still be up after getting four or five hours of sleep constantly. Yeah. Especially on prep. I do drink a lot of black coffee, but I can't function without coffee. The first thing I do is put the kettle on and obviously show day that that is where I falter as well because I'm dying to put the kettle on, but because I'm dehydrating, I'm thinking, I can't even have a coffee. What am I going to do? But my coach actually lets me have an espresso now on the show morning because I can't cope otherwise. <laughs> that, hey, that that is a treat. But I always like to ask are all the guests that I have on, you know, whether it be my bands or my bodybuilders or any other guests that I have for my bands, I always like to ask, you know, what is that feeling like when you get to step on stage and perform in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that also applies to the bodybuilders that I have on. What is that feeling like for you when you get to step on stage and show off all of that hard work that you've worked months upon months for? You know, it's great. Um, you can't see anybody anyway. Obviously people who step on stage know that you can't actually see an audience, but I like being able to hear them. I have a lot, I've met a lot, a lot of nice people in this sport and I've got a lot of friends in this sport and it's great to hear them shouting for you and egging you on and it is really, really good. It's really good. But you can't see them. I can't even see the judges. For one, if I've not got my glasses on, I can't see anywhere. <laughs> For two, it's just too dark, just way too dark. Does time seem to slow down or does it seem to speed up when you're on that stage? Um, no, do you know... I've had a bit of a mixture of both. I've, I've been on and I've thought, oh my God, this is taking forever. And it's warm on there. When you're pulling your poses, like we said before, it's difficult. It's like doing a workout. You're out of breath. You're getting hot. You're getting sweaty. The lights are shining on you. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's too much. And then you think, oh, this is going so slow. But other times it goes really fast. And then you want to do it all again once you've come off. Yeah, I think it really also, yeah, depends on, you know, what you really bring to the show. But yeah, that's just that's just so, you know, again, what these people have to go through to get on that stage alone in and of itself. I mean, that should be rewarded. And then to be able to, you know, just get through that prep season. But now we get to one of the fun questions. What is your go to post show meal? Oh, well, this time it was pizza. I was just so looking forward to pizza. and. I started eating it and I had to take the rest back. We stayed in a hotel the other week on our last show and uh, me and my friend both wanted the same. So we went and we got a pizza, but it was quite late. So we had to go to Pizza Row. We wanted to go and sit down and properly tell them pizza, but it was too late. So we ended up running in Pizza Hut just before it fit, before it closed. We got a pizza. We ate about two slices and then said, I think we'll take it back with us. So we were sat in bed about two o'clock in the morning eating pizza. God, yeah, you're making you're making me drool right now, even thinking about those things. But yeah, that's all. I always said if I ever competed, I would just rent out like a burger joint, and just be like, hey, you're gonna feed me until I either throw up, pass out, or die. You know, either way, I'm getting my money's worth. But I also love to ask because it's not talked about at all on Instagram is that a lot of people don't realize that look that you guys put on stage that is not a sustainable look. What was that like for you when you first realized that you know like hey this look that I put on stage it's not going to be sustainable and I'm going to have to put on weight. Was it a struggle and has it gotten easier for you as your career's gone on? No, it's horrible. And even now I'm 2 weeks out of comp now and I've looked at myself this morning and thought right I need to rein in now everything's gone fluffy and I call it off season fluff. Um, no, I don't like it. I like to be ripped. I like to, and, but it's just not, it's like you say, you just can't keep it like that. One, it's dangerous. Nobody can keep it like that. It just is no good. And you can't build like that either. You can't train like that. You just can't, you can't move on. So you'd never grow any more muscle. As we all know, if you, if you stay like that, you start burning away at muscle. You have to think about what cardio you're doing, what you're lifting. And now I can go heavier again and, start doing a little bit more in my classes and one thing and another and but no you're right you can't keep it a week in and it's it's going now already well like you said you haven't worked out for two days so for anyone that might be struggling with you know not getting their workouts in when they really need to what are some ways that you like to use so that you aren't just going crazy thinking about like oh my god i gotta work out 
Well, lucky for me, with me working in gyms, I've got keys to most of them. So when we're short, I can still go in and do my bit. If I'm sat at home thinking, I need to go and work out, I'll go. Oh, I'm talking about like right now when you have to take two days off. Like, how do you distract yourself so that you're not like just constantly thinking like, okay, I need to go to the gym immediately. I'll go for a walk. Makes me feel that little bit better. Even though I've not lifted, I feel I've done something. Yeah. No, and that, and that's so awesome. And I mean, I we talked about this before we started the podcast, but the biggest myth and stereotype that I love to bust on this show is that, you know, it's gotten better the last five years due to Instagram, but there are still so many women that have that fear where if they touch one weight, they do one push up, they do one pull up, they're just going to put on, you know, 50 pounds of muscle overnight. And I always say to that, you know, you'd be the biggest commodity of all time. I mean, so many things just, just, are just so wrong with that. And did you have that fear when you were getting started? And even if you didn't, I bet you hear that all the time now. How do you like to respond to that? Um, and I always say I wish yep. if it was that easy we'd all look like that but no it, it just doesn't happen like that does it it's a slow process and it doesn't happen overnight and it's something that you've really got to work at you know I train like six days a week yeah. people always turn around to me and say you only need to train three days a week don't you well yeah in moderation if you're not wanting to grow too much muscle and stuff like that so I would say to people no carry on lifting just cut it back a little bit or you know don't lift this heavy and you don't have to lift that heavy if you're not growing too much muscle but again it's the food that you're putting in which will help you grow so if they're lifting but they're not putting the calories in they're not going to grow that big anywhere it's it all boils down to the food really that's one thing that I wish I wish they would just be ingrained in people's heads is that, you know, and another positive thing, too, about it is if you do start working out, I mean, you can normally eat more than you're even eating now, even if you were overweight, as long as, it's, you know, the healthy options and you can still put on muscle and get bigger and stronger. But adding on to that question, I always love to add on that. I mean, one thing that I think impacts women so much more than men in the weight room positively is the confidence boost that you can get from working out. I mean, we've heard so many stories about people who've been, you know, making life changing decisions or, you know, they've just really helped them out in their own lives. And I always say that confidence boost is the one thing that you can take from the gym and use it to impact every aspect of your life. How have you used that confidence boost to impact your life in, in a positive way? Um, I don't know, really. I, I do just use it. It's it, it does make me feel more confident because you're more body confident. So. When you know you're doing your utmost to, to look your best and you're making your body look like you want it to look, that's where the confidence comes in. So it's like it's like I said to you before, I've not trained for two days and my body confidence is, is going down after two days. If I go and train in the morning, I will feel on top of the world and I'll, I'll get back into it again and I'll, I'll start feeling better and my diet will get back on track you know as soon as I get in that gym in the morning I'll be thinking right this is what I want to eat today I'll do these meals and I'll stick to my diet more whereas if I sit oh I think oh, I'll just have another day off it, it doesn't work like that so getting your mindset around doing is probably the only way that I get confident is by doing what I'm thinking. Well, and I got to say, you still look better than 99% of all the 50-year-old women on the planet, even though you're, you're two days off from working out. But also, to add on to that, I mean, you do not look like the average 50-year-old. Has it been hard for you to get used to the fact that, I mean, if you go out there looking like that, I mean, you're going to get stares. Some people, you know, you might draw attention to yourself. Has that been difficult for you to get adjusted to that? Um, No, no, not at all. I think a lot of people look up to me for that and a lot of people find me inspirational, which is lovely. I've got a lot of friends who come to the gym and they'll say, you are an inspiration. It's lovely to hear. It's a really, really big confidence boost for me, that. And I think it's lovely that people do find me inspiring because of my age and because of what I do. And it's just really, really nice. And people do look up to you. How long into your journey before you decide that you wanted to become a trainer and help out others? Um, probably about 12 months in, because I used to be a beauty therapist. And then um, about 12 months in, I thought, you know what? I should work in a gym, really, because I'm there all the time anyway. And I went back to college and did my fitness instructor course. And I was going to do my PT course, but to be fair, I've, I've not really needed to do it. I am so busy doing classes and one thing and another that I'm happy where I am. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm quite happy where I am. My classes are busy. But again, like I've said today, my classes are busy. 
because people aspire who I am and and like me for I've got a good personality I think I, my personality comes out in my classes and I look good when I when I when I'm cut back I look good and I've said today I don't want to put too much weight on because then I don't look like me in my classes and but which is wrong really but it's just the way that I feel when I'm in shape and aspiring for the people to do what I'm doing well and I always got to ask too because we see like you said all these you know, posts on Instagram of people who've made these weight loss transformations and we get to see what it's like for them personally to make that change. But what is it like for you as a trainer, knowing that you made such a huge impact on them? Does that make everything seem worthwhile for you all the times that you've had to, you know, coach them and, and be with them? Does that really help knowing that you did change their life? Yeah, definitely. I mean, even people who start the gym and they haven't been for like four or five years because they've had a break because they've had children and one thing and another, and they come back and they're always a little bit timid at first. It's nice to make them feel at ease and see them week in, week out coming back and the confidence growing. I, I've, I've got one lady who's been coming to me now for about six weeks and I've watched her week in, week out, and I actually said to her this morning, you've come on leaps and bounds and you're just doing so, so well. You know, and it's lovely. It's nice to watch people's journey. And it's nice that people trust you and watch you and, and, well, just trust you in general and like coming to your classes and they look happy and they're enjoying it. And that's, that's what it's about, really, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that. And honestly, for anyone out there, I mean, if you can get a job where you can help out others and really just, you know, help benefit them, I mean, it just feels so good. Personally, for me, it does. So, you know, it's just such a rewarding thing. But two of the questions that I love to ask all the health and fitness guests that I have on for the first one, I mean, there were so many positive things for me when I started working out. But one of the negatives are you're going to get asked to move a lot of people's furniture. You're going to get asked to open a lot of pickle jars or any other type of lid that's really held on tight. I'm still at home with my parents and, you know, in, in two months I'm moving out. But every time they bring home groceries, I basically have to lift the car into the driveway and carry in the groceries. Has that been a similar experience for you when people take one look at you and they just assume that you can do favors for them? Um, I don't really get that a lot, to be honest. I think I had once and he said, I can't open this. Can you do it? And I was like, yeah, probably. <laughs> but I did. Oh, Which was lucky. great. So I'm glad that I did. But that was a lid on something. I can't remember what it was, but it was a lid on something. And I did it. So, yeah, people do think like that, don't they? But... Oh, I, I, I always say it's a double-edged sword for me being six foot three. Because, I mean, if you get... I mean, I could have zero muscle at all, and they'd say, you know what, hey, tall guy, come help me do all this. So, yeah, I always do find that interesting. But my audience favorite question, I mean, they they love this. And, again, it's a multi-million dollar idea is when it comes to clothes for fit women, I mean, fit guys have their own problem. And when I have guy bodybuilders on the show, you know, I ask them the same thing. But for women especially, I mean, if you have big, broad shoulders, dresses aren't your best friend. Jeans are another thing that we hear of all the time where if you have a big lower body and a small waist, I mean, they're not built for that. What are some ways that you found that you're able to compensate for the fact that your clothing options can be very limited? Live in gym wear. Yep. <laughs> That's the answer. Live in gym wear. What else can you do? I love it when, I, when I'm cut right back and I'm like in a little size six and the big round the waist and I think I'm where I should be. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, I just live in gym gear. I'm in a gym every day anyway. So generally I'm just, I get up, throw my gym gear on. I have loads of different colors of trainers and one thing and another and just live in them. <laughs> it's easier hardly get dressed up anymore well yeah i i always say you know if anyone can come up with like jeans or whatever for fit people or any type of you know clothing definitely get on that but now we go to the questionnaire part of our podcast where i like to ask our health and fitness guests at least a half dozen questions and sort of get their answer and see how they stack up to everyone else that we've had on so for our first question what is one item that you always need to have in your fridge Ooh, egg whites I used to be huge on eggs and egg whites, but then, you know, I ate them so much that, I mean, my stomach, it just wouldn't digest them rightly. I mean, I just, I just ate way too many of them. So now I got to tone it down a little bit, but the most surprising answer that we've had on the podcast is mustard because a lot of these bodybuilders, zero calories, zero fat, they just douse whatever they have in mustard to, you know, help them, you know, put it down. But now out of all of your followers that you have on Instagram, what would be one thing that you think they'd be surprised to find out about you if they met you in person? Um... Oh, that's a difficult one. Um, my age, probably. We'll go with that one. Oh, I can, I can, I can agree to that as well. Yeah, it's and that's just and that's just so awesome. And like I said, just such an inspiration to to just be able to to see that. But 
also now in, in the questionnaire, if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Julie, we made the decision, you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you would like to see changed? Um, oh, oh, I don't know, really. Um, maybe doing a routine in competition. I'd scrap the routine bit so we didn't have to dance around on stage. That's the only thing I would change, really. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's actually, that's the first time we've heard that. But yeah, I've, I've been waiting for someone to say that. But a lot of the times we get like, you know, like have more parody where like some judges are looking for a more lean look. Some judges are looking for a more muscular look. I mean, if they just had like one standard look where they're just like, okay, everyone, if you can look like this or the closest to this, you know, wins. Because I've heard stories, you know, about people who do one show one week and then the next week they do another and they've won the first show and then they don't even place the other one. The different federations are looking for different things. So, yeah, you are right in that. That does happen a lot. And you, you see it all the time. But um, like I said before, my favorite saying is it is what it is. Yep. And, you know, everybody deserves a fair chance. So what's good for one person one week is not good for another one the other week. But then it can change around, which is good, which gives everybody a fair, fair scope. And it, it's nice for them. If they go one week, don't place, then go the other they place. And, Everybody deserves a chance, don't they? So it's good that they do look for different things, really, in that respect. Well, and we talked about, you know, a body part that really took off for you and a body part that really lagged behind. But what is your favorite body part to train and least favorite body part to train? I love training my back. That's my favorite. I love doing back. Um, I don't like doing, well, there's not much that I don't like doing, but I would say legs. <laughs> along with everybody else you probably will say legs as well good luck getting out of bed the next day if you do a really really hard leg day that's 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 one thing too that's one thing that i think really just makes it i think it would honestly it's just the fact that we use it so much that like honestly if like we walked on our arms then arm day would probably be like the hardest the hardest thing to do so yeah that's 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 one thing that i think just is a, a pretty big thing in that but now if you could go back in time and talk to the 18 year old version of yourself what would be the best piece of advice you would give her Start younger than 47. <laughs> Start competing younger than 47 and probably make more of a... If I started younger, I don't know, maybe I'd have gone on to be a pro or whatever. I would have pushed myself to them limits and I wouldn't like that. I've got a friend who's just become a pro as well and, you know, I watch her and she just, she inspires me really. She's really, really good. So she she's my coach as well. So she tells me everything to do when I was saying, can I have your shoulders? In fact, I'll have your legs as well. And I go through a body part of it. I love that. Yeah. And I want arms like that. <laughs> Glutes like that. She has arms better than yours, first of all. So what? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe not now. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. And the, and I always said, you know, if I went back in time, you know, I'd say to probably like the same thing, get into it more. I mean, I did start really working out when I was 18, but still, you know, there's just, I just find that question so fascinating, but you said that you're taking a year off. So what are your plans during your year off? Is it just trying to, you know, get bigger and put on more muscle or what, what are your goals? Yeah. I don't want to get too much bigger, but yeah, maybe a little bit harder. Maybe a little bit bigger, but not much. Because um, I'm quite happy with my size now. Especially this year when I, when I cut right back, I was happy with my package. So maintain that and then we'll see where it goes. I don't want to move up into another category. I want to stay where I am. I have got a bit of scope in this category. I could go a bit bigger if I wanted to. But to be fair, concentrate on the bits that need working on. Legs, for example, they need a little bit more work. Um, they seem to be the only bit that ever really lets me down because they don't cut through as much as everywhere else. Um, I carry estrogen on my legs and, and there's nothing I can really do about it. I try and everything I've tried, it gets better and better each year. So hopefully concentrate more on that and try and overcome that problem and see if we can get anywhere with it. Um, but apart from that, my upper body I'm really happy with. I can't, I can't say I'm not happy at all with that. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And do you have any piece of advice for people who are older, maybe in their, you know, their forties trying to get in shape? Because I always like to say I'm 24, so it's going to be easier for me to start a fitness journey than it is for someone who's older. Are there any, is there anything that you like to tell people in order for, to get them motivated to walk into the gym? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of older people sometimes think that once they reach a certain age, that's it, you know. They should have done it younger and now it's too late. It's never too late. You're never too old. To Everybody should have goals and everybody should try and reach them. And it's never, ever, ever too late to so just go for it. 
just go for it and follow your dreams. Just do what you want to do. I mean, yeah, honestly, I couldn't agree with you more on that. It's just so important because we've had people, you know, they've started in their, you know, late 50s, early 60s on this podcast. And it's just so inspiring to see all the changes that can be made at any age. So, yeah, honestly, just just never give up when it comes to when it comes to just bettering yourself, I think. That's right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? Yeah, my coach, Jane Single. Um I'd like to say thanks to her for everything she always does for me um, and making me look like this, giving me all the best advice possible. And also I have a good friend who used to coach me. He was my first coach, uh, Paul Thompson. Paul Thompson's lovely, great guy, good friend of mine. Um, I give a shout out to him as well. And Kelly, obviously, for sponsoring me in town and my bikini sponsor, Annabelle, I guess. So from Bikini Love and apart from that, yeah, everybody else who supported me really. So I got to ask, so what's it like now being a mom? What are your, what is your kid's opinion of, of having a mom with muscles now? Oh, um, the boys, I have two older boys. They're not that impressed, really. They, um, I don't know what they actually, they're, they're a bit better now. I think as time's gone on, they've, cut, they've come round to the idea. But at first, I think they thought it was hilarious. You know, they, they, they say to the make really, they call me big jewels. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, Molly, my daughter, she's, She's stood by me all the way through and she's been to most of my shows and she is my biggest fan and she shouts at the top of her voice, come on, mom, and I can hear her and it's great, you know. She's she's really, really good. That's awesome. And again, you guys, we cannot thank Julie enough for coming on and sharing her story. I mean, it was such a delight talking to you. And is there any last piece of advice that you'd like to give out there for people who are struggling and just trying to find the right tools in order to start getting better and start adapting a more healthy and fit lifestyle? Um, basically, just go to the gym. And if, if you are stuck, ask. Ask somebody to help you. Ask somebody to inspire you. Get some PTs. Um, get help at first and then write everything down. I always have a log book to be fair. And I do write down what I've lifted and what I've not lifted and what day I've done this on and what day I've done that on. And then I'll change it all around. But yeah, have a log book, keep records of everything. And again, YouTube is such a handy tool. You know, if somebody gives you an exercise program and you look at an exercise, sometimes even me, sometimes I'll look at it and think, What's that? And I'll have to YouTube it and I think, ah, that's what that is. But yeah, use these tools that are there that are available. Don't be frightened or be put off. Go and just do it. Just go for it. Go for it and enjoy it. I couldn't agree more. And again, you guys go and give Julie a follow. I'll leave a link to her Instagram page down below. And again, Julie, we could not thank you enough for being on the podcast. It was a delight to talk to you. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot signing out. Have a great day, everyone.